and we're about to break the yep. world record for longest world championship game. We are nearing history here. Will it be a decisive game today? Uh, it's. I have no idea how to answer that question, but I know that either way, we have broken history here in the 2021 World Chess Championship because the move Rook to D2 officially makes this game the longest game in World Chess Championship history. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to be looking at Game 6 of the World Championship match between Magus Carlsen and Jan Napomniachi. Now, this game is a very epic game. It features several records. First of all, it is the longest game ever played in World Championship history. And secondly, it is also the longest game in World Championship history with a decisive result. And the third thing that I will add separately, and not to be a spoiler or anything, but this is probably one of the greatest end games that you will ever see. All right, with further ado, let's jump right into the game. So we start with d4. Knight f6 is played here. Magnus goes knight f3. Jan plays d5. Magnus plays g3 here on move three. Now, this is a slightly strange order for Magnus to play like this. In previous games in the match, very specifically in the second game of the match, he chose to play a much more traditional order where he went straight into the Catalan. Um, now, it wasn't this exact order, but c4, e6, g3 here. Bishop e7 and bishop g2. He takes c4, castles, castles, queen c2, and b5. Again, this can occur from many different orders, uh, but in this game, Magnus plays g3. Now, you probably wonder, well, what's the reasoning behind it? Um, if you intend to play the Catalan systems, very specifically, systems with c4, e6, g3, and say d takes c4, for example, after white plays a move like bishop g2, you can play knight c6. You can also play like bishop b4, bishop b2, followed by a5, or followed by c5 here. But when Magnus plays g3, on move number three here after d5 the purpose behind this move is that black actually does not have the same options after black plays a move like pawn e6 bishop to g2 here if you want to play lines with say d takes c4 and knight c6 or very specifically d takes c4 and bishop b4 you do not have that option anymore fortunately for jan in this in this match he's prepared a different setup which you can play no matter what white's move order is However, once again, I would caution players who are watching this video that if your intention against the Cat Catalan in the normal move order is to take on c4 followed by knight c6, you have to have something ready for this move order with 3g3 because otherwise after bishop g2, let's say you play bishop e7 as occurs in the game, castles, castles, after white plays c4, you'll now notice that you're still in the Catalan, but because both players have castled their kings here to the king's side, once you take on c4 and white plays queen c2, you no longer have the same lines with knight c6 and also as you played bishop e7 you no longer have lines with bishop b4 so that is something to keep in mind for the future if you are playing these lines with d takes c4 and an early knight c6 or an early bishop b4 check against the catalan so back to g3 very briefly i don't like jumping around all that much but back to g3 uh one thing that was interesting about this opening choice from jan in terms of playing e6 here is that black can actually play the move 3c5 and this, this is objectively, I think, the strongest continuation. I myself have played this in the past. And now let's say white plays bishop g2 after c takes d4, knight takes d4, black can play the move e5, knight to b3, bishop e6 here, castles. And after bishop e7, bishop g5, knight b to d7, black is doing very, very well. I myself have played this quite a few times with black. I've had it against Wesley So in the Grand Chess Tour in in uh, Tata Steel, India, 2019. I also had it against Vedic Gujarati as well in another tournament. So this setup, if you can get it with black, is very, very good. But again, after g3, c5, white can now play a move like c4, for example. White can also just play bishop g2. And you end up in completely different setups and positions than probably what, uh, at least what Jan was hoping for in the opening. So having played in the candidates tournament in 2016, I did a lot of preparation for several months before the event, before the event began. Now, having, having spent that time to prepare, generally what you want to do is you want to have a set repertoire and you don't want to be surprised. So for example, let's say white here after knight f3, d5, uh, let's say white plays g3. And again, you prepare lines like knight c6 with d takes c4 or lines with e6, d takes c4 and bishop b4 very specifically here. What happens is, is that uh, your opponent will, of course, your opponents will obviously be thinking about, well, if I play c4, how can I trick my opponent to avoid their preparation? 
So when you do this preparation, you want to have a set repertoire, set openings where you can not get move ordered or tricked. And that also cuts down on the amount of work that you have to do as well. So to use a very specific example, in the candidates in 2016, my preparation was to play the Queen's Indian defense. So E6, C4, and to play B6, G3, and either Bishop B7 or Bishop A6 here. So this was my preparation, but there is a slight problem, which is that after D4, Knight F6, Knight F3, if you try to play, actually, sorry, D4, Knight F6, sorry, not this order. After, after Knight F3, Knight F6 here, White can play G3. And what you'll notice is that if you play e6 here after bishop g2 you can no longer play b6 well i suppose you can play b6 but it leads to very different systems and if you play d5 here now after d4 you'll notice that white has tricked black you can no longer get the queen's indian defense here because b6 is not really considered to be a very solid move at this point in time so because of that with my intention of playing the queen's indian defense i actually my what i had to come up with was to play e was to play was to play g3 and to play d5 immediately on move two um or to play b6 on move two immediately with bishop g2 bishop b7 now again it's very very tricky because if you play a order a move order like this now what happens is this is quite different because let's go back to move, move number one let's say g3 you play d5 bishop g2 e6 this is my traditional setup and let's say white castles bishop e7 and white plays d3 followed by knight bd2 and e4 playing the king's indian attack how do i get back to the system that i want so what i had to do for the candidates tournament was i basically had to learn a whole new system against the king's indian attack as well featuring g3 b6 bishop g2 bishop b7 castles d5 d3 and just playing e6 knight pd2 bishop e7 followed by c5 and an early knight c6 if you guys are curious about some of my games played in this system uh you'll see there's a game that i lost to, to on each gear unfortunately despite getting a great position i might add because otherwise you might think well wait but you you just lost the game like uh, i mean why is it a big deal um but i did play the system against anish giri in the london chess classic in december of 2015 and i did get a good position for future reference um i also have this i believe in a game against uh against a player from russia i forget his name i think it was about 2400 and it was the second round of gibraltar in 20 2019 those of you who want to find the game can look it up um but i don't remember right off what the name is i'm sure in the comments of this video you guys will definitely be alerting me to to what that game was at any rate um this setup with b6 bishop b7 is what i learned for the candidates but i did have to learn multiple systems to make sure that i could get exactly what i wanted where i could not get move order and tricked and have to play some system that i was unfamiliar with all right so back to the game so g3 is played so Jan plays e6 again because he had his set repertoire with this line um in the catalan after c4 d takes c4 queen c2 b5 he's not worried by magnus playing this move order so magnus realizes this and he chooses to play b3 now this is an interesting choice here normally when white plays b3 to do the double fianchetto here you don't do it with d4 there are a lot of situations for example where you'll get a position like this knight f3 knight f6 g3 e6 bishop g2 d5 castles bishop to e7 and white will play something like c4 castles and b3 so setups with bishop b2 are much more common when you've not put the pawn on d4 because you want to keep the diagonal open towards the h8 square here so back to the game here after b3 is played here as i said it's not the most common setup because again you have the pawn on d4 so the bishop on b2 is not aiming at anything however many of the themes remain the same where white still wants to play for c4 and capture back with the pawn and open up the diagonal from the bishop on g2 towards the rook in the corner on a8 so b3 is played Jan plays c5 again it's c5 probably is the easiest way to play you can also maybe go b6 to fianchetto the bishop a move that a lot of beginners might play out of out of natural instinct is a move like knight c6 this would not be a great move because after bishop b2 followed by c4 your knight is in front of this pawn so you can't really attack the center here you see this pawn on d4 e5 is never really a move because it's overprotected. so the way that you want to chop chop or chip at the center is to play c5 here and go after the pawn whereas after knight six bishop b2 there's no pressure now white will play c4 at knight d2 rook c1 and there will be a lot of pressure down the c file so c5 is played here by Jan. correct move d takes c5 is played by magnus bishop takes c5 is played and now magnus plays c4 here again you'll notice that black in this case actually now has a big center here it controls a lot of the squares and additionally white really needs to activate because right now you have this bishop that's on g2 kind of a closed diagonal this other diagonal is kind of open but for example say you go bishop b2 
knight to c6 and you play let's just say a move like knight to d2 after queen c7 you go c4 to attack the center and now after d4 followed by e5 here black is doing very well additionally you'll notice it's somewhat similar to game number nine where magnus actually played a similar setup with a knight on c6 and a bishop c5 as black so c4 is played here and now d takes c4 is played by jan queen c2 is played by magnus and now queen e7 of course you cannot capture the pawn on b3 here because white will play queen takes c5 so queen to e7 is played by jan magnus plays knight bd2 a very inspired choice by the way white can take this pawn uh you would not really want to take with the b pawn here because if you take with a b pawn after knight c6 and e5 here let's just say bishop b2 and e5 black is starting to play e4 the bishop is really active on this on the light squares you can go to e6 or g4 additionally you have these split pawns so long term there's going to be pressure towards the pawn on c4 however having said that it's not like this is outright losing or it's actually all that bad even but it's probably completely fine for black and white probably is not playing for the advantage here so magnus plays knight bd2 and here jan plays knight c6 now again in a match where both players have had a lot of time to prepare it's very hard over the board to figure out what the best moves are or what's preparation and what isn't preparation obviously up to this point magnus had been moving instantly and so jan chooses not to accept the gambit if this were not a world championship game and the players did not have months on end to prepare it's a, it's a little bit unclear to me whether jan actually would not have captured this pawn on b3 now you cannot capture the bishop on c5 because the queen on e7 is guarding it so you would have to play knight takes b3 and now after bishop to d6 here it looks like it looks like black is doing okay however after bishop b2 white has a lot of compensation you're gonna maybe have a have threats like knight g5 here say you play a move like let's just say b6 terrible move by the way to be clear um and now after knight g5 white attacks the rook on a8 so when you play bishop to b7 white can go bishop takes f6 here which removes the defender of the h7 pawn so now after you play pawn takes bishop white goes queen takes h7 which is very simply checkmate so white has a lot of compensation in this position with the open diagonal additionally uh you besides having threats like knight g5 you can also just bring your rooks into the center of the board very very quickly by playing rook a c1 and rook a d1 as well that being said after knight c6 here it remains to be seen if white has enough compensation for the pawn but Magnus certainly had prepared this and I suspect that he felt that a it was pretty likely Jan would not go for this variation and B he felt that if black if black maybe is still slightly better you probably can simplify enough to where you're never in danger so that's probably the reasoning and the rationale behind team Magnus choosing to play this variation in the game now note I say team Magnus because I do believe that a lot of his preparation was done by Magnus's team and it was not done specifically by Magnus so knight c6 is played by Jan here instead of grabbing the pawn knight takes c4 and now Jan plays b5 which is a great move here considering that Magnus was still in pre still in preparation and Jan clearly was not not at this point in the game very very good choice very good understanding and very good job controlling the nerves here again objectively it's not that difficult of a move to find but it's still under the circumstances it is a good move note however let's say black were to play a move like bishop bishop d7 after white goes bishop b2 white is in fact quite a bit better because the bishop is on this diagonal where it's not really aiming towards anything on d7 white can play for rook d1 rook ac1 maybe even knight e5 at some point as well to uh to, to play on the diagonal towards b7 and towards towards the pawn on b7 and towards the rook on a8 all right so b5 is played here by jan Magnus plays knight to e5 note that a move like knight f to e5 looks very strong because after knight takes knight knight takes knight if black moves the rook to b8 to, to avoid being captured white can play knight to c6 forking the rook and the queen and after queen c7 white can play queen takes c5 simply winning the game and if black plays bishop b7 here white can trade on b7 and white can go queen takes c5 and again white is simply winning so knight ce5 is played here by magnus sorry not knight fe5 because after knight fe5 black does not trade the knights black can now play knight to d4 and after knight to d4 if white plays a move like queen b2 black gambits the rook on a8 by taking the knight on c4 and after bishop takes a8 black is a very nasty move pawn to c3 because if white takes the pawn on c3 you go knight e2 forking the king and the queen and after queen to b1 here 
there are many ways black can be winning probably the simplest one is just to play bishop b7 here bishop takes b7 and now i mean it's it's really a fielder's choice here i personally would probably play uh i probably would play pawn to c2 queen b2 and queen takes b7 and you're hitting the pawn on e2 and you should be winning here all right so of course magnus being a very strong chess player and the world champion does not make this mistake he plays knight c to e5 so after knight c e5 yon plays knight b4 again note that bishop b7 is maybe playable here but it feels a little bit iffy because after knight takes knight bishop takes knight white can now go pawn to b4 attacking the bishop on c5 and if you were to move the bishop say capturing the pawn white can very simply take your bishop on c6 and white is winning in this position you can however play bishop takes f3 but after bishop takes f3 bishop d4 here white will play bishop takes a8 bishop takes a1 and after bishop f3 white is quite a bit better because white will develop the bishop say you play a move like let's just say knight d5 here bishop d2 black goes bishop to f6 and after white plays rook c1 here white controls the open file white also has the bishop pair and while in the short term it doesn't seem like it's that big of an advantage for a player of magnus's caliber this would probably be close to decisive for for him if he had this with the white pieces all right so knight b4 is played by Jan. magnus plays queen b2 and now Jan goes bishop b7 which is the whole concept behind pushing this pawn because now the bishop is on a great diagonal where it opposes this bishop on g2 so the bishops basically offset each other in this situation so Jan, so magnus plays pawn to a3 Jan goes knight c6 now magnus plays knight d3 again keep in mind match score is even a very very tense game and Magnus really would rather not just trade off pieces here because for example say he trades on c6 after bishop c6 if you play a move like bishop f4 here black can now play a move like rook a c8 followed by rook fd8 and again it's not it's not as though this is winning for black but black has, black's bishops are better placed he's probably gonna have better placement of the rooks on the two open files as well and it could be a little bit tricky here for for white so Magnus plays knight d3 instead it's worth noting by the way however there is one other continuation here which is very very complex which is this move bishop to g5 now bishop g5 during the game I remember looking looking very briefly and thinking well I this is probably just nothing you go h6 however there is a lot of lot more venom to this move than it would appear because after h6 there's a very tricky computer line here where white can play knight takes c6 bishop takes c6 bishop takes f6 here and now after queen takes f6 queen takes f6 g takes f6 white can go rook fc1 bishop takes f3 rook takes c5 and after black trades the bishop on g2 and plays a move like a6 after white plays <clears throat> rook ac1 here white is quite a bit better he controls the open c file black has double pawns on f7 and f6 and additionally white can maybe even play rook c6 or rook c7 rook b7 rook cc7 and try to put pressure on the seventh rank so white should be a little bit better whether this is enough to play for a win unclear but Magnus I think would have been able to put a lot of pressure on Jan had this happened so it's a little bit peculiar that 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 Magnus did not play Bishop g5 um after Knight takes e5 Knight takes e5 which is also a line Bishop takes g2 King g2 Queen b7 Black would be doing very well so Knight d3 is played <clears throat> Bishop b6 is played by Jan Magnus goes Bishop to g5 and Jan plays Rook fd8 here again black could play h6 to try to break this pin from the bishop on g5 towards the queen on e7 but white would just take the knight anyway so it doesn't really make sense to waste the tempo with this pawn push when you can develop your rook to the center of the board here with rook fd8 so after rook fd8 magnus plays bishop takes f6 Jan plays pawn takes which is also kind of interesting you can maybe take with the queen here but after queen takes queen takes pawn takes when white goes rook fc1 maybe white can play for a small advantage with knight c5 next move you do have the bishop pair but the bishop on this diagonal from from b6 to g1 it looks really nice but it's not really threatening anything specifically and white will be able to play knight c5 white also can probably move this f3 knight out of the way to open up the diagonal as well so white might be able to claim a small advantage here so g takes f6 is played rook c1 is played by magnus and Jan plays knight to d4 a very nice move again black has a slightly compromised pawn structure so what you really want to do here is mainly you want to simplify and you you want to try to activate your bishops and play on these two open files it's essentially about about a couple things it's, it's about the two diagonals from b7 to g2 b6 to g1 and it's about the c file and the d file if black can put enough pressure and simplify to where the two bishops become really active he should be quite a bit better 
So knight d4 is played by Jan. Knight takes d4 by Magnus. Bishop takes d4. Now queen to a2 is played. Jan trades the bishops. Doesn't really have a choice because white will trade. Trade on b7 as well. So they trade. Queen b7. King to g1. And now Jan plays queen e4. Very nice move. Activating the queen. Puts it in the center of the board. It's targeting a lot of squares here. So it's very centrally placed. And now black can also sort of ask ask white what are you doing if you can't play e3 here this bishop on d4 will be very very strong aiming towards the king on g1 um and at the same time you can't play f3 because that would that would leave your king under attack so black can maybe claim an advantage here so queen c2 is played by magnus Jan plays a5 here magnus plays rook fd1 and now king g7 is played by Jan. Now, I will add one thing here. It's sort of, we'll see this in the game happen anyway, but one thing at the time that I was very confused by was why Jan did not play rook c8 here. Felt as though if he wanted to play rook c8 and offer this trade of the uh, of the two rooks for the queen, it would make sense to do it all the way even back here, potentially, where, where white has not moved the rook on f1, and white has to go like rook e1 or maybe rook c2 back. And again, it's it's a little bit unclear here what's going on because black can play h5, h4, h3. He can also go like e5, queen f5, e4. And so I would have preferred that Jan had played rook a c8 initially right here rather than playing it a couple moves later. Because in the game, Jan goes to a5, rook fd1, king g7. And now this is really the, the, the first critical moment of the game, you could say. Himself played knight f4, knight e1, knight somewhere to trade queens safely. And Jan is back at the board quickly. And he's up now 13 plus minutes on the clock. So here Magnus thinks for about 30 minutes and plays the move rook to d2. Now this move really caught me by surprise. During the during the live commentary that I was doing on this game, I was thinking, well, in this position, white should play pawn to e3. Again, fits with the themes of what I said earlier, where white wants to close down this diagonal. So let's say black goes back. After queen e2, white has closed the diagonal, so the bishop is not really attacking anything. And now white can maybe get a little bit aggressive here and play for knight f4, attack upon a b5, or even like knight f4, knight h5, queen g4. And it starts to feel like this might be spinning a little bit out of control here. And I felt very strong that if Magnus had played this, he would have been able to claim an advantage. Um, and so I was very surprised when after a 30 minute think, Magnus plays rook d2 here. So now Jan plays rook ac. And again, getting back to what I said earlier, when we look at this position after queen c8, rook c8, rook c8, queen d5 you'll notice that white has a rook on d2 here so the rook is about the rook is optimally placed versus the other position where if we go back here you'll see the rook is glued to e1 the rook on e1 here is not very active it can only go to the side here to um to to i mean to, to not protect to not protect the pawn or to get out of the way whereas in this position if you look here after um after after this position you'll notice the rook can now slide to c2 it's on the open file their idea is like rook c2 maybe like uh let me just make some random moves just so you guys can see it to illustrate the point where you get some position like this now the rooks are very very active here because the rook on d2 can activate to, to c2 and c8 or even to c2 and c7 whereas the other line here the rook can only go to the side and so it's going to take a lot more time to activate the rook from e from e1 versus being on d2 where it can just go to c2 instantly so it's definitely a little bit peculiar to see magnus magnus um end up in this situation but also to see Jan not not play rook a c8 immediately so queen d5 is played here by Jan. magnus plays b4 not knight f4 by the way this would be a very very big blunder because after knight f4 black can play bishop f takes f2 which is a discovered check on the king and after king takes bishop queen takes rook black is simply winning the game so b4 is played here by magnus Jan plays a4 magnus plays e3 again a move that in retrospect is not a great move um but at the time it makes some sense probably better would have been to play rook c c2 queen to b3 and rook a2 and white should be able to hold the draw pretty comfortably here with the rooks on a2 and d2 protecting each other at some point you can play knight c5 you can also go rook c2 and it should not be too dangerous however magnus was low on the low on the clock here at this point so he plays e3 which is a slight mistake because it allows bishop b2 here and after rook takes b2 queen takes d3 you'll notice that the pawns on a3 and b4 are extremely weak and cannot be defended now now in retrospect i suspect Jan rejected bishop b2 because he saw rook to c5 here <clears throat> and i think that he figured well i can go back like queen d7 but after rook c c2 bishop takes a3 where exactly where exactly is this bishop going white has rook a2 
and after e5 it's it's a little bit unclear here but even beyond even beyond the pure analysis he probably saw that the bishop on a3 just it's not going over knight guards b4 guards c1 and guards b2 as well so that's probably why he plays bishop e5 now here magnus plays h4 a very good move a move that it, when you look at it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense but what it does is it creates a lot of extra space for the white king so the king doesn't just have the g2 square and this is a very deep concept here um because you you'd think well the king is safe you can just go to g2 but say we get to some position where I'm gonna make some random moves here you get to some position like this for example um black will always be able to make like a check and a check and make a draw because the king does not have enough shelter but when you play this h4 move back here you play this h4 move you now create multiple squares for the king on g2 and h2 so there's a lot more space and the king is always going to be very very safe behind this pawn chain here additionally besides besides creating more space h4 also you try to maybe uh take some space away from black and maybe create some mating threats way down the line um which you guys will not see at the at the present moment so h4 is played h5 is played by Jan Magnus goes king to h2 here Jan plays bishop to b2 now but again you'll see it's it's much later versus before we're now having this inclusion of h4 h5 if anything it can only help white because after rook c5 here you'll notice that b5 is still under attack but h5 now is also under attack as well so queen d6 is played here by Jan Magnus plays rook b1 bishop takes a3 rook takes b5 queen d7 is played here rook to c5 and this is the second critical moment of the game uh, but yeah the queen on f8 actually defends things and if knight h5 king g6 that's why i thought things weren't so easy um whoa e5 instead of bishop takes b4 well we mentioned this on the previous move as an idea and the point is the knight the knight cannot move anywhere besides b2 at this point because the rook is hanging so as much as we're looking at ideas like this not possible so here jan Jan was leading on the clock and this, and remember there was no increment so with three and a half minutes to make five moves it's still very very tricky because it's not completely clear what the absolute best move is and there's no way to simplify immediately so Jan here plays pawn to e5 and this is sort of really the start of going in the wrong direction in this position Jan should have played bishop takes b4 because if white takes the bishop you have queen takes d1 however after bishop takes b4 at rook c c1 while it looks like black is better you'll notice that uh you'll notice that it's very hard for black to really prove this pawn is worth a lot the computer says bishop a5 is the best move again not a very human move to me the human move here would be to play bishop f8 but after knight f4 queen b5 for example you'll notice that after rook c8 and rook d8 here white is actually getting a lot of counterplay here they're going to be big attacking threats towards the king and let's say you play a3 rook d8 a2 is played here again trying to uh, make a second queen there's a very beautiful win here with rook takes f8 a1 queen rook g8 king h7 rook h8 king g7 rook g8 now again not to not to not to overpraise Magnus or make him sound like he's he um he can read the future but if we go back to this position before h4 let's play let's play this out in the exact same way kind of let's say white plays uh you get some position like like well, I'm just gonna make some random moves you get a similar um similar situation here where white plays well let's say let's see how exactly do I get this um how do I get this let's say you take I take of course you guys ignore the evaluation function here because it shouldn't matter but say you get some position like this I'm just going to set try to set up as best as I can um so that we see something sim something kind of similar I know I know it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense here but say you get some position um like this for example after rook, G, rook takes f8 black makes a queen you'll notice that when you go rook g8 king h6 the king is very comfy and it's very safe on h6 here so black there are no mating threats for white so, whatsoever so by including this h4 h5 even though at the time it didn't look like it did a whole lot there's a very deep concept down the road of trying to create this checkmate plan um that we see in the game here because like I said if these pawns are on h7 and h2 or h3 there's no checkmate idea um in this line with rook cc1 bishop f8 now again I suspect that the reason Jan did not go for this is he probably saw ideas like knight f4 rook d8 rook c8 he thought white has a lot of counterplay and I think he also additionally thought after e5 it's a very tricky move Magnus doesn't have a lot of time on the clock and if Magnus plays the wrong move here he could very easily lose Magnus however finds an excellent move he plays rook cc2 
uh queen d5 is played here not e4 by the way because after e4 here white can now go knight b2 queen to e6 and now after knight to c4 bishop b4 rook to a1 black still is this pass pawn at a4 but you aren't really going to be able to keep it keep it for all that long here and white should be completely fine once again however magnus avoids probably the blunder here which i think is what jan was hoping for was pawn to e4 because after e4 queen to d4 here white is now in some serious trouble because all these all the all the issues with black turning e4 really aren't serious um i'm just gonna set this up a little bit differently so to illustrate the point all these ideas with e4 here are not really serious because white can always go knight f4 and the pawn chain is completely intact here and you attack h5 but if white is ever able to if 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 white is at if black is ever able to win the pawn on e4 it completely changes because after say a move like rook a5 queen takes e4 let's say you go rook takes a4 now black can go queen e2 and after a move like rook a1 black goes e4 and while the computer still says white can maybe salvage it you'll notice that at the base of the pawn chain is very weak the knight is also under attack black can maybe push the pawn all the way down the board and this could go south for white in a hurry here so rook to c2 is played by magnus jan plays queen to d5 magnus goes rook d d2 basically con connecting the rooks here now bishop takes b4 is no longer a threat because you can take and the rook on c2 guards the rook on d2 so queen b3 is played rook to a2 another excellent move by magnus and around this point i sort of started was starting to feel that there are some issues for black because now if black takes the pawn on b4 with the bishop after knight b4 queen b4 white can go rook to d3 with the idea of rook to a3 stacking the rooks on the a file and collecting this pawn in a4 here and after that it's going to be very very difficult for black to even draw the game now again computers have sort of shown that two rooks are not generally as good as a queen in almost any situation oddly enough whereas like when I grew up without without using computers all the time especially the early years the general theory was that the queen the two rooks are all two rooks are always better than a queen but that has definitely shifted that is one of those things that computers have shown us over time to not be true um so keep that in mind uh because there are some players and I'll give a very specific example I had a game against Fabiano Caruana in the Sinkfield Cup I believe it's 2016 where he just gladly sacrificed two rooks for my queen and I assume that with the two rooks against the queen in the end game I was winning but Fabiano even though being what I suspect was slightly worse he drew the game with literally no issues whatsoever very easy draw so that is one thing that computers have definitely shown us is, is that rooks uh, are generally not as good as the queen so rook to a2 happens um and now Jan plays e4 he does not play bishop takes b4 knight to c5 queen takes b4 knight takes e4 is played here of course black does not take the knight because now after rook a3 rook a2 you will actually just lose the game because white has four pawns here on the king side versus your three and after rook takes a4 you're just you, you can't do anything whatsoever so queen b3 is played by Jan. magnus plays rook c2 Jan goes bishop f8 trying to keep the bishop and the knight on the board because again when you have the bishop versus the knight here a couple things in the end game when you have an outside pawn let's just say even if it's a, even if it's like say bishop versus knight or knight versus knight if you have an outside pawn the knight always has to get distracted by the pawn and so in this case specifically with the bishop versus the knight and the outside pawn the knight can never really go after the bishop here like you'll see the bishop is too far away the knight moves in an l shape and if you play knight to c5 say queen b5 knight d7 to go after the bishop now i just move the bishop back to d4 and then i start pushing the pawn and like you'll see that, that it's very hard from distance for the knight because the knight can never really exchange itself for the bishop and the bishop also protects the pawn pushing down the board here so knight c5 is played queen b5 now magnus goes knight d3 again illustrating a few things first of all he's trusting that the two rooks on the second rank can prevent the pawn from ever getting to a2 and secondarily because h4 h5 has been played in this game He's going to go knight f4 and try to go after this h5 pawn potentially say black just plays moves like queen a5 knight f4 queen b5 white can go rook d5 knight guards the rook attacks the pawn and you'll be able to um to like move the rook to c8 capture the pawn come back and white should be winning here so Jan plays a3 magnus goes knight to f4 Jan plays queen a5 here putting the queen behind the pass pawn again another end game concept usually you hear, you hear about the one with the rook behind the pass pawn but in this case it's the queen behind the pass pawn and this has actually been a common theme throughout the match with the queen behind behind a far advanced pass pawn so queen a5 rook to a2 is played here Jan plays bishop b4 Magnus plays rook to d3 basically trying to keep an eye on this pawn and setting up 
setting up a, a plan down the road which will occur in the game where white is able to sacrifice the rook for the pawn on a3 so let's just say here black plays a move like queen c7 after rook takes a3 bishop a3 rook a3 this might not be winning computers actually hold this pretty routinely unlike humans but it's very very scary because what, what white will do long term is white's going to put pressure on h5 let's say you go queen c2 here for example after knight h3 it's it's a very deep concept but i'll show you guys what the plan is the plan is that let's say i play queen c5 rook a4 queen c2 step one put the rook on f4 where it protects the pawns because first of all you'll notice that like in this position black can never attack the pawn or the rook the rook is lodged on is permanently lodged here on f4 if you could put a pawn on e5 or g5 then you could attack the rook but you can't do that because your pawns are stacked and so what white wants here is basically eventually to rotate the knight around to d4 so you go king g7 knight d4 king g6 and at a certain point to play like rook f5 say queen c8 rook to a5 let's just say you go queen b8 and now white wants to go knight e2 put the knight on f4 and collect this pawn on h5 as well again amazingly even at this point the computer says after a move like queen b2 knight f4 king g7 that this is only very slightly better for white uh but for humans especially knowing that you can never win here you feel like you're really going to suffer in a position like this because after king g6 knight f4 king g7 you have double pawns white has four pawns here and it feels very very brutal again this is why computers are better than humans because the computer would look at this position it would play perfectly and draw without without breaking a sweat obviously whereas humans would be sweating for sweating profusely for the entire time okay so back to the game so rook d3 king h6 is played here rook d1 queen a4 rook d a1 bishop d6 again magnus is just basically trying to put maximum pressure on the pawn here to where the bishop can never really go off this diagonal and hoping for something so king g1 is played queen b3 knight e2 queen d3 knight d4 king h7 again not really anything that magnus can do here he's activated the knight to about as optimal square as you can put it on uh if you try to play knight to c2 here black can now go bishop to e5 attacking the rook on a1 if you play rook takes a3 black goes queen takes c2 and now you're losing if you play knight takes a3 black is actually winning here because bishop takes a1 rook takes a1 queen c3 and because your knight is all the way on the rim here on a3 versus the other side of the board here you're actually not going to be able to save the knight and the rook and so after rook a2 queen to b3 rook a1 queen to b2 again both the knight and the rook are under attack and you're gonna have to move the rook away and give up the knight now the funny thing is even here if you lose the knight after rook d4 this is also a theoretical draw because you can still put the rook on f4 and wait forever so after king g6 you go king g2 and you basically literally just move your king between these three squares g2 h2 h1 g1 this whole box black can never cover all four of these squares even if he gets this position for example where the king has no squares now you just wait with rook f3 rook f4 forever so it would still be a draw here all right so king so king h7 king h2 is played here by magnus queen to e4 is played by Jan, and this is the critical blunder of the game i can say with some confidence this is a move that costs Jan any chance at winning the world championship in 2021 now in retrospect it's very easy to see what happened based on the press conference based on what Jan was saying and Jan essentially was saying that he felt that it was pretty much a draw no matter what he did here and this is one of the great strengths of Magnus is that he can always sense when there's still some play or there are still some very small tricks in the position and Jan was basically saying well everything is drawn it's no big deal uh but he completely overlooked what Magnus was going to do here which is rook takes a3 if Jan just waits here with say a move like king g6 or even bishop bishop e7 there's there's really no chance for Magnus to win this game that's all Jan has to do is just sit here and wait and there's nothing that can be done instead Jan plays queen e4 which is a very big mistake because now Magnus plays rook takes a3 and now if you take the rook on a3 we get to this end game after rook a3 like I alluded to before where white is going to go rook a5 followed by knight e2 to knight f4 and put a lot of pressure on the pawn on h5 again for a computer it's no big deal and it says it's just an easy draw for black for us humans it doesn't really work quite like that is what I would say so that that's that's broadly speaking um how it goes here all right so let's go back so after rook takes a3 is played queen takes h4 is played here by is, is played here by is played here by Jan again he doesn't really want to go into this end game very very concerned about it and I don't blame him frankly I I don't blame him I, it makes makes a lot of sense so he plays queen h4 
King G2. Queen D. King G1, sorry. Not King G2, by the way. King G2 does not work here. Because now after Queen E4, if you play F3, I have Queen G6 to attack the pawn with the bishop and the queen. But additionally, your rook is still under attack here on A3. Last point is that if Queen E4, King G1 is played after you trade on A3, this is not winning because without the pawn on H4, I can now play H4. We trade the pawns, and after a move like Rook A7, King G6, the king guards both pawns, and I can just start checking you all over the board with my queen. Very easy draw. So King G1 is played. Queen E4 is played by Jan. At first glance, it looks like maybe you can go Bishop G3, but after F takes G3, Queen G3, King F1. Not King H1, by the way, because now Black would just repeat here with Queen H3, Queen G3. After King F1 here, H4. White is actually able to stop the pawn by going Rook 1, A2, um, Pawn to H3, and now going Pawn to E4, opening up, opening up both of these, uh, both of these, these lateral, um, uh, lateral, lateral files, I guess you could say. So, so now after like Queen H4, I can just go, I can just go King G1, King H2. Let's say you take, I get Knight F3 even. White is very, very safe. The rooks guard all these, all these ranks, the second and third ranks, and it should be a very simple win for white. So bishop takes g3 doesn't work. So Jan plays queen to e4 here. Magnus plays rook to a4, and now Jan goes bishop to e5 here. Again, trying to pin the knight on d4. Knight e2 is played. Queen to c2. Rook 1 a2. Queen b3, and now king g2. So what Magnus is doing here is very slowly improving the position. He, he prevents his pawn push to h4, and he also wants to maybe go knight f4, or maybe go knight g1, knight f3 down the road. As Additionally, the thing is the king is very safe here due to the black pawn structure. If black could somehow get a position like, let's say, let's just say um, a move. I'm just going to put this on the board for a second. Some position like, like this, for example. After black plays a move like queen e6, this still probably is better for white, but there always are a lot of checks on the light squares potentially down the road. And so it's very hard to protect your king. Whereas in this position, the rook on a4 basically prevents it. Because if you play h4 here, I can just take, and my rook is not hanging on a2 because it's check on h4 towards the king on h7. So in this position after king g2, Jan plays queen to d5. f3 is played here by Magnus. And now Jan in this position plays move queen to d1. So here Magnus plays pawn to f4. Now initially it looks as though it would make more sense for white to move the knight to f4 here, but after knight f4, black can play king h6, and it's not really clear here how is white going to activate the rooks here and maybe go after the pawn on h5. So therefore, f4 is played by Magnus. Jan plays bishop c7. Now, in retrospect, computer says something like bishop b2 is playable, but for a human, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because white will simply go king f2 here. So Jan plays bishop c7, much more logical, much more human move, trying to put the bishop on this long diagonal from a7 towards g1. King f2 is played by Magnus, and now Jan goes bishop b6, and Magnus plays rook a1. So here, queen b3 is played by Magnus, and this is where, kind of, in this position, Jan should have played a move like queen d3. Now, in retrospect, again, very easy to understand why this is a better move, but queen b3 is also very natural because you figure, well, if white goes rook a3 here, you can just go right back down to d1 and this bishop on b6 is very very strong their idea is like queen h1 queen h2 and this should be completely fine however after queen to b3 magnus really starts to show his genius here understanding that he can now play rook e4 which guards the pawn on e3 and additionally he can now activate the rooks by doubling them on the eighth rank so again there is a reason that we say Magnus is the greatest endgame player probably of all time, and that is because he finds all these little ideas that are not obvious at all. I suspect that even if I had five minutes to glance, I don't think it would right off occur to me why rookie four is such a better move, but Magnus finds this almost instantly here. So after rookie four, king g7 is played, Magnus plays rookie eight. Idea again to maybe double up the rooks and go for a checkmate on the eighth rank with rook g8 and rook to h8. f5 is played here by Jan. Magnus goes rook a8. Again, perfect activity. Rooks are on the 8th rank. Additionally, the rook on e8 also guards the pawn on e3. So if white went from a position where the two rooks on the a file were pretty passive to a situation where now he's rooks on e8 and e8, which are perfectly placed. Queen b4 here is played by Jan. Magnus plays rook a c8. And now Jan plays bishop to a5 with a very cheeky idea of trying to go queen e1 check and then queen f1 mate. Say white plays a move like, let's just say rook h8 here. You have queen e1, king to f3, and now queen f1 would be checkmate. Pawn and f5 controls both of the squares on e4 and g4. So after rook to c1, Jan plays bishop b6. Rook to e5 is played by Magnus. And now Jan plays queen b3, 
trying to put maximum pressure on the pawn on e3 with the bishop and the queen here additionally preventing white from playing rook takes f5 so after queen b3 rook to e8 is played by magnus again kind of a waiting move at this point in the game both players are getting low on time so sometimes you want to make a repetition and gain the extra 30 seconds on the clock so queen d5 is played by mag played by Jan. rook c8 c is played by magnus queen to h1 rook c1 queen d5 and now rook to b1 is played now you feel like at this point in the game Jan has defended extremely well and it feels like it's getting very close to a draw but magnus in true style just keeps on playing keeps grinding looking for more opportunities the so bishop a7 is played here rook to e7 bishop to c5 and now rook to e5 after queen d3 he finds rook b7 now it's worth noting that at this point probably this whole setup is a little bit wrong but only a player of magnus's caliber would be able to find this last little possibility of squeezing something out of this position so rook b7 queen c2 is played by Jan. again you have to guard the bishop here for example bishop a3 would be very bad because in this position white can now play something like rook b to b5 and he's going to be able to win the pawn on f5 and also probably the pawn on h5 as well additionally your bishop on a3 you cannot really target the e3 pawn both c the c1 and c5 squares are covered here so this would be very very bad for black so he plays queen c2 guards the bishop additionally rook c7 does not pin the bishop on c5 because black can go bishop takes e3 check and after rook takes e3 queen takes c7 black is completely fine here so instead after queen c2 magnus plays rook to b5 and now bishop to a7 again Jan has a pretty straightforward setup keep the bishop on this diagonal magnus plays rook a5 bishop b6 rook b5 bishop a7 and now magnus plays rook takes f5 and very smartly he realizes that there is a simple simple way that even though it looks like black is going to be able to to win this pawn on e3 there is a sacrifice so after queen d3 you do not go rook after e5 because then bishop takes e3 would be fine for black because if you play rook takes e3 black will take the rook on b5 if you move the king to let's say g2 you'll lose knight on e2 and last but not least if you go king to f3 black can play bishop to c5 checking the king and when you move the king i take the rook as the bishop is in the way and it cuts off the coordination of the two rooks so here magnus plays rook takes f7 the only try king takes f7 rook b7 king g6 rook takes a7 and now this is the start of the end game which is a very unusual one at that white is a rook knight and three pawns for a queen and a pawn now the computers show that this is a pretty easy draw with perfect play but again the players have been playing for up to seven hours at this point they both are definitely tired and only one side can win here which is also very very important and makes it a lot easier for magnus to play with the white pieces the so queen d5 is played rook to a6 king h7 rook to a1 and now here we got a, again a bunch of moves coming very quickly king g6 knight d4 queen b7 rook a2 queen h1 rook a6 king f7 i will not go through these moves because they're sort of uh they're maneuvering and magnus is trying to set up a certain certain position knight f3 queen to b1 rook to d6 now this is an important move because now the knight covers h2 uh which is why the queen moved from h1 because it couldn't go to h2 and additionally the knight will also cover the d2 square so when black checks you can just block with the rook so king g7 is played rook to d5 is played here by magnus queen to a2 is played by Jan. rook b2 of course knight guards the rook queen b1 rook e2 queen b6 so again in this position the point behind rook e2 is white wants to start pushing the e-pawn off the board with the rook behind the pawn potentially let's say black goes queen b8 after e4 queen e8 e5 queen e6 it starts to get very scary because now white can play knight g5 and with the rook behind the pawn white is threatening to push the pawn all the way up the board now again with computers you'll notice that it's completely fine even the evaluation bar says it's zeros but in practical play it's very difficult so after rook e2 Jan plays queen b6 logical move pins the pawn so you cannot start pushing it up the board rook to c2 is played queen b1 knight d4 queen h1 uh rook c7 king f6 rook c6 king f7 knight f3 queen b1 and you'll notice that basically there's a lot of maneuvering here but not a lot is happening white still is not pushed either the e or the f pawn up the board and additionally it feels like he's gonna have to probably bring the rook back to d2 so now knight g5 is played by magnus king to g7 is played here knight to e6 king f7 knight d4 queen h1 rook c7 king f6 knight to f3 queen to b1 rook d7 and again very very similar position white has not actually improved whatsoever so the show must go on 
queen b2, rook to d2, queen to b1. Magnus plays knight to g1 here. Now, again, not a whole lot has happened, but at the same time, only one side can win here. So Magnus now tries to go for a new setup with knight to e2. So queen to b4 is played, rook to b1, queen b3, rook d6, king g7. And now Magnus plays rook to d4, queen to b2, knight e2, and queen b1. And this is where Magnus finally decides he has to push forward with pawn to e4. Now, again, for a computer, it will say zero is very easy draw. For a human, it's much more difficult. Now, one thing that I think was overlooked during this game, and this is not to critique Jan in any way, shape, or form, as, this, as they were already seven hours plus into the game, but it's worth noting that White has not really fundamentally improved a whole lot versus 20 moves ago at the start of this end game. And so this is why Jan plays a move here that even to me at the time felt correct, but turns out to be wrong, which is he played queen h1, rook to d7, king to g8, and now rook d4, queen h2, king e3. And here he plays the very obvious looking move but a move that in in retrospect i think is completely wrong which is pawn to h4 now in general here what you think is that the king is very well protected you have a knight you, knight and a rook you have a couple pawns around it you probably want to play h4 so that you can open up the king a little bit more there's one less pawn protecting the king but it turns out that after this move the task becomes significantly harder in retrospect it would have been better not to trade the pawns it would have been better to play a move like queen h3 king to d2 and now potentially play either h4 or just wait with your king close to the center of the board here again for computers very easy to see for humans it's a lot more difficult um so this is no way critiquing on but oddly enough this h4 move which i thought was very correct at the time turns out not to be the strongest move so white takes queen to h3 king d2 queen takes h4 rook d3 and now again there's going to be a big shuffle here king to f8 rook f3 queen d8 king e3 queen a5 king f2 queen a7 rook e3 queen d7 and now knight to g3 is played queen d2 king f3 queen d1 d2 queen b3 and now king g2 again not a lot of progress has been made white has the rook behind the pawn but again now that there's no g pawn it feels like if you start pushing too far there should be a lot of checks on the light squares potentially towards the white king in this situation so queen b7 is played by Jan, falling back on the earlier plan where if you, we go back um quite a few moves you'll notice that uh let me get the position where where we had this position where he put the queen here to prevent the pawn so now as we go forward to this position it's the exact same concept where the idea is you want to pin the pawn now keep in mind the computer says that this is a draw with perfect play but but magnus finds a very creative idea here so as i was looking at this position live i figured while well, the rook's optimally placed behind the pawn knight is optimally placed probably you want to try to move the king up and push the pawn but here magnus plays a really really brilliant concept and something which shows why on many occasions i as i've said he is the best end game player in the world he plays rook d2 queen b3 and now he finds the brilliant idea of rook d5 and it's very counterintuitive to put the rook in front of the past pawns here to me as a human we think about all these end games you think well put the rook behind behind the pawns you want the rook here behind the pawn you never want the rook in front of the pawns but in this case this is the one in a million situation where the rook is much stronger in front of the pawns than behind the pawns and we will see why as magnus demonstrates the rook e5 is played here king f7 now rook f5 king e8 d5 and the reason this is so much stronger is that white has a very concept very basic concept he wants to put the rook on f6 where it will be guarded by the pawns and then he's going to slowly snake the king up the board and use the knight as a shield so queen a2 is played here king h3 queen e6 king h4 now again black can still play a move like queen a2 here but what white will do is white will go knight to h5 and now if you check on h2 white goes king g5 you play queen g1 and after king h6 you'll notice that white is now going to play knight g7 and rook f6 so let me make help moves to illustrate how brilliant this really is rook f6 queen g1 knight g7 king e7 and now white can go king h7 followed by king g8 and it's a very nice shield here so after knight g7 knight g7 check you'll notice that after king e7 white can now go knight f5 king to e8 and now you play pawn to e6 here and it's very winning for white because after you play queen h1 king to g7 queen to g2 and now you go king h7 and the idea is very simple let's say i play queen g1 you go knight g7 king e7 rook f7 check king d6 e7 and now after queen h1 i go king g8 king is completely shielded there are no checks except for a8 
and then I make a queen and I win the game because the knight protects the pawn. Additionally, if instead of king e7, you go king d8, it's more of the same. I play rook f7, you go queen h1, king g8, and the king is completely shielded, and the knight is just going to support the pawn going up the board to make a queen. So therefore, this is an amazing concept by Magnus. Uh, the fact that he was able to figure this out with seconds left on the clock is beyond amazing. Uh, because to me, even when I was watching it live, it did not seem like the first instinct. I suspect that with enough time, I'd probably find it as well if I have five, ten minutes to think about it. But at least intuitively, first instinct, first glance, it did not seem like the right concept to put the rook in front of the pawn to me. So queen h6 is played here, king knight h5, queen h7 here, and now Magnus plays e6. A very, very nice move, and he sets up the concept. Again, remember Magnus was playing with increment, so he did not have time to think for five or ten minutes and conceptualize the win here but he still is able to find it the idea with e6 rook f7 and knight g7 queen to g6 is played here by by Jan. not queen takes f5 because now after knight g7 the king and the queen are forked and if you play and after queen g6 magnus plays rook f7 the final nail in the coffin here pawn supports the rook and now if you take the pawn thinking you've survived unfortunately you you lose by one tempo after knight, e, knight g7 check forking the king and the queen king takes f7 knight takes e6 king takes e6 king to g5 we reach the classic opposition where after king f7 king f5 if it was white's turn here this would be a draw but because it's black's turn black has to yield if you go to g7 i go king e6 king f8 king f6 king g8 king e7 king g7 f5 and now the pawn marches all the way up the board the king boxes out the black king and supports the pawn push to the end where it will become a queen so after rook f7 Jan plays king to d8 and now Magnus plays pawn to f5 supporting the pawn on e6 again the pawns and the rook protect each other going all the way up the board queen to g1 and now after the move knight to g7 Jan resigns in view of what we saw earlier where white is going to push the pawn to e7 and then e8 the rook supports the pawn push knight supports both e6 and e8 and to give you one sample line let's say black checks on h1 king g5 queen to g1 you go king to h6 here queen to h1 you do not block with the knight keep moving the king up king to g6 queen to g2 king to h7 queen h1 king to g8 and now again the king is completely shielded here by the rook and the knight and now the knight supports the pawn and it will just go all the way up the board once again and make a queen and magnus carlson he's going to shush the doubters he's put his finger to his lips too early in certain events and there it is there's the handshake and that is magnus carlson taking the three and a half two and a half lead the first decisive game in more than five years of classical chess for the world chess yeah, championship so in this position after after knight to g7 here magnus after the after this move knight to g7 Jan resigns here and with that Magnus wins the sixth game of the world chess championship a game which broke all sorts of records longest game ever played longest game at which was ever decisive and a true mental truly mentally de destructive game for Jan Napomniachi here as he had no way of coming back from this game I would add myself having lost some games against Magnus which have gone six to seven hours when you lose in one of these end games where you don't think you can ever lose it's very very difficult to come back from it mentally and it's no wonder that Jan especially in the press conference was so distraught after this loss uh but on the other side credit has to go to Magnus finding some amazing amazing concepts throughout this game most importantly to me finding this concept with rook to e5 the idea of putting the rook in front of the pawns is second to none and it's a good example of why of why Magnus is the world champion and why as I've said on many occasions one of the biggest difference between Magnus and other players is his feel in end games when players have very little time on the clock it, it's much better than everybody else he's able to sense these ideas even in an end game like this by the way where it's not completely clear cut what the best plan is and nobody has really looked at these end games because they don't they generally don't occur a rook and knight and two pawns against the queen is a very very rare end game let alone it being two connected pawns in the center here and the fact that Magnus intuitively with very little time was able to find the right concept with rookie five f5 shows why he's the world champion and why he is the best endgame player in the world.